Good morning. My name is Fidel Gomez. I, uh, 38 years ago, we were part of starting the Church Calvary Chapel of Fort Lauderdale, but after 38 years, my wife and I decided it, it's, it's been long enough, and so we retired, and now I have the privilege of being able to visit and uh, help out my brothers whenever they need some time off, and so that's why I'm here today. Thank you very much, Pastor, for the privilege of being here. If you brought your Bibles today or if you have your smartphone or you brought a flat screen TV with you, whatever you brought, would you open it to John chapter 15, the Gospel of John chapter 15? We're going to look at a couple of verses. I've entitled our time together, Jesus is calling you. He's calling you. And so we've prayed, we've asked the Lord to bless our time together. In John chapter 15, John chapter 15 is a part of a longer discourse. It's called the Upper Room Discourse. It starts in John chapter 13, where Jesus enters into a conversation with his disciples and he ends up washing their feet. And he says, I've left you an example that if you do as I've shown you, you will be blessed. He, in chapter 13, also in that upper room, nobody knows whose house it was or might have been on top of a roof somewhere. But he also says, one of you is going to deny me there in chapter 13. In chapter 13, he also tells Peter, you're going to um, or, or betray me. And, and he tells Peter, you're going to deny before the, rooster, before the rooster crows three times. In John chapter 14, while they're still in the upper room, is where Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. And in chapter 14, he also teaches them about the coming Holy Spirit. The world doesn't know him, hasn't seen him or accepts him, but, but the Holy Spirit will be with you and the Holy Spirit will then be in you. So then, for whatever reason, it seems like Bible scholars think that that's about the time that he leaves the upper room and he is headed towards Jerusalem because uh, the next night he will be crucified, or the next day he'll be crucified. And so they're walking in John chapter 15, and Jesus always used a visible something or other as a pulpit by which he could teach his disciples. So he's come across this vineyard, and he's going to talk to them about the vine and the branches. And we'll come back to that, but I want you to start with me in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 15, where he writes, let me start in verse 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friend if you do what I command. And then he says in verse 15, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. I don't know if you played sports. Maybe you're still playing but me growing up in, in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, going to Rancho High School playing baseball, Coach Reed, before the game, he would sit the team down. And he would give some final instructions. Something would be very important to him on his mind about how we had been practicing, what he had been seeing. And so he would tell us information, give us instruction that were very special to him, very important to him. Maybe a pep talk, maybe a correction. But he would say things like, guys, don't forget now. Don't forget when this happens, we need to do this. And don't forget when this guy comes up to bat, up to bat you need to do this. And it's like that in John chapter 15. And 13 through all the way through 17 is what is called the upper room discourse. So Jesus is sitting with his disciples. And this information is very dear to him. It's special to him. He's going to be crucified. And he'll rise on the third day. But he wants to communicate 
something that is very dear to him. And he says to them, you're no longer called servants. Now you're called friends. There, there's been a change. There's been a, a radical change that he is taking them from being servants. Picture a servant. A servant doesn't have any real connection to the master, if you will. The servant isn't really a part of the personal things that happen in a home, but a friend. A friend is different. Do you have a best friend? A best friend, you, you tell them everything. And you know that, that because they are your best friend, it's going to be kept secret. It's supposed to be. But a friend, there, there, there's a, the difference between a servant and a friend is that a, a, a friend, there's intimacy involved. I, I wrote it this way. I don't know if you take notes or you'd like to write things down. But, but it, according to this verse, Jesus is more interested in intimate fellowship than just a distant relationship. He desires to get personal with you. How, how often do you make it a point in your life to set aside time where it's just you and the Lord? Now, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about uh, you read the Bible and you underline some verses and, and you pretty much have fed your head. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what happened in Exodus chapter 33 verses 9 through 11. It's Moses. It's Old Testament, I know. Moses is leading the people out of Egypt to the promised land. And that's a big, big job. A lot, a lot of responsibility. He's got to deal with a lot of people. He's got to face, he's going to face problem after problem after problem. And he's got to be the one that is looking for ways to provide for these 2.5 to 3 million people. It's a big heavy load on his shoulders. So what does Moses do? At the beginning of the day, he takes a, a tent, some kind of tent. It's not the tabernacle yet, not yet, but he takes a tent. Now, you got to remember, how old was Moses about at this point? Over 80. He, he's a senior citizen. He, he, he's carrying a tent. And you got to picture how many different tents there are when the crowd is 2.5 to 3 million people. And he makes it through all these tents, and he makes it outside. He goes outside of the camp, Exodus 33 says. <clears throat> he wants to get away from all the clamor. He wants to get away from all the noise. He wants to get away from all the distractions. No television, no phones, no kids. Nothing. I'm going to go outside to a place where it's just me and the Lord. And the Bible says there in verses 9 through 11 that when Moses would go into the tent, he's, he had to construct the tent somehow. He goes into the tent. And when Moses would go into the tent, the Bible says that a pillar of cloud would descend, would come down, and would stand at the entrance. And when the people in the rest of the camp saw this, they all stood up and, and focused and their gaze on what's going on here. And the Bible says that inside of that tent, that the Lord would talk to Moses. I'd just like to be a fly on that wall and hear that conversation. And it says that it goes on to say in verse 11 that the Lord would speak to Moses face to face like a friend speaks to a friend. Now, don't get caught up in that phrase of face to face because, you know, the, in the next few verses, in, in verse 20, it says, uh, the Lord says, nobody can see my face because if they do, they die. The word, the, this phrase, this idiom, this Hebrew idiom in verse 11 means to be intimate God, God doesn't have eyes and lips and a nose. 
But there was a time when God and Moses just spent time together. Maybe the Lord encouraging Moses. Maybe Moses pouring his heart out to the Lord with no distractions. You ever find that whenever you want to make time to be with the Lord, all of a sudden, all these things that you forgot to do, all of a sudden you remember? I will find myself that I'm going to spend time with the Lord, and as I sit outside on my little patio thing, Lord, it's just me and you. Lord, it's just me and you. Oh, man, I forgot to send that email. Lord, it's just me and you, though. It's just me and you. Oh, man, I got to go throw the trash. I never think about throwing the trash unless I'm trying to get serious with the Lord. It's important that you take note of that before we go into the next verse. Because if we don't preface verse 16 with Jesus desiring intimate fellowship, then verse 16 can become a chore. I got to do what? Wait, you, do you know how busy I am? And, 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 and if we don't preface verse 16 with Jesus desires intimacy with you, then verse 16 can become just a heavy responsibility. I, I found myself that I, I lost for, for a season in my life, <clears throat> I lost intimacy with the Lord. I did. There was a time when our church at Calvary Fort Lauderdale, 30,000 people between the main campus and the nine or 10 other campuses, 30,000 people. I'm busy. My appointments start at 6.30 in the morning. I got things to do. I got places to go. I got people to see. So my, my, my devotion time consisted of I open the Bible, I read a verse, I uh, close the Bible. Lord, I got to go. I never lost my relationship with the Lord. But I didn't have any intimacy with the Lord. I didn't have that personal the Lord and I spend time together and we communicate. There, you have to set that time aside. I know life is busy. I know life goes fast. I know you got a lot of responsibilities. But answer this question to yourself. What can be more important to you than to make the time to sit with the one that created you. What can be more important than that? Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Seek first God's kingdom and his righteousness, and then he will add all these other things. But Jesus never said, Seek first answers for your questions. Jesus never said, Seek first direction for your life seek first the lord spend time with him is such a priority and yet so many of us so many of us lack in that so he said to them i, I don't call you servants anymore we're friends we share we talk we communicate with each other so now, in verse 16, the Lord says to him, to them, in verse 16, you did not choose me. Would you, would you please, if you have a Bible or a way that you can underline that, would you please take note of that? Jesus made a choice. You didn't choose me. But I chose you, and I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. Jesus is calling. He's calling you. I want you to notice that he said, you didn't choose me. I chose you. 
I, I wrote it this way. You have been handpicked by the Lord himself. He picked you. He, he, he saw something in you. He picked you. And listen to this, first P, um, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says. He chose us before the creation of the world that we would be holy and blameless in his sight. Did you catch that? <laughs> before, before, before the concrete trucks backed up to pour the foundations for the world, before he created anything, I'm choosing you. That's special. How many of us ever embrace that? Not in a prideful way. Not in an egotistical way. But in a very truthful way. I am chosen. God has chosen me. In the same chapter, in the same book, Ephesians 1 verse 11, the Apostle Paul says, In him we have been chosen having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works everything out in accordance with his will. In him you were chosen. But here's the problem. Here's what uh, many of us say. I don't feel like I'm chosen. I feel so unworthy. I'm such a sinner. I don't think... I'm probably a leftover. He, he probably picked everybody, and I had, it was leftover. Okay, you can come too. Come on, I'll choose you. He chose you before the creation of the world. And his choices don't make sense all the time. Because we can look around this room and look at somebody we know and think, God chose him? God chose that person? 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 26 through 29 are incredible. Because the Apostle Paul talks about being chosen. And he says this, brothers, think, think of what some of you were when you were chosen. Not many of you were wise according to human standards. Not many of you were influential. Not many of you were from a noble birth. And don't you love the next word? But. But. What did God do? God. What's the next word? Chose. And look at who he chose. He chose you. He chose me, but God chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. God chose the lonely things. God chose the despised things. God chose those that are not to nullify those that are so that no one would boast before the Lord. You feel like a foolish person? He chose you. You feel weak? He chose you. You feel lonely? Like you're the bottom of the barrel? He, he chose you. You feel despised? You feel like you're nothing? He chose you. And I want you to notice something. I want you to notice something. Please notice in these verses. God chose. God picked. And he did it of his own free will. You, you weren't left over, and you weren't somebody that he just had, was stuck with. He looked at you, and he said, I'm choosing you to be my child. Before anything else, you're a child of God. And then you're a heavenly representative. So sometimes we feel foolish, yeah. But you're still a child of God. Again, we go too much. We go too much by, uh, you know how I feel? No, what does the Bible say? The Bible says that he chose you. 
But then we go to the next part of the verse and we ask ourselves, to do what? Well, in the next part of the verse, in verse 16, after he says, I didn't, you didn't choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you. Would you circle, if you can, or underline that word? I appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit. You have been handpicked to be a fruit-producing heaven representative. You have been handpicked for a purpose. And he says, I appointed you. Another word that you could write there, in, right beside the word appointed, is the word ordained. Did you know that you were an ordained minister? That's what Jesus says. I've, I've drafted you into the Lord's army. I've drafted you into my service. I've chosen you not just so that you could enjoy the benefits of being my child, which is tremendous in and of itself, but I also have something I need you to do. Ephesians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul says this, you are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which have been prepared far in advance. You've been created to do something for him. So the question that comes up is this. What are you doing for the Lord? Are you using the gifts? Because you have gifts. You do. Everybody, everybody has a gift. An ability, a talent, every one of us. And you can look at the book of Romans chapter 12 to see what some of those gifts are. You can look at Ephesians chapter 4. You can look at 1 Peter chapter 4 and see what some of those giftings are that God has given to you. But your abilities and your talents, they work for you here in this world because you have a job. And because you are qualified because of your gifts, talents, and abilities, you're able to hold a job. But God didn't just give you that talent and those abilities just so you could earn a living. He used it so that you would bear fruit that lasts. It's not just beneficial on this earth but it's going to last into eternity. So without being condemning, because there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ, just a question. If everybody in this church shared the gospel the way that you do, would we be a church full of people that share the gospel? If everybody in this church read and studied their Bible as much as you do, would we be a church that is biblically educated? If everybody in this church, as, as the brother read here, Derek read about giving, if everybody in this church supported this ministry with their tithe the way that you do, how would we be doing? He has called us to bear fruit, fruit that lasts. But, but like I mentioned to you, like I mentioned to you, listen. If you don't remember verse 15, you're his friend, and he desires intimacy with you. If you don't remember that, then as you go into verse 16, you go, oh, man, I feel condemned. I'm not, as, I'm not a good Christian. Everybody else is a better Christian than me. Now you're condemning yourself. And that's not from the Lord. How is it then that this me bearing fruit that lasts, how is that going to happen? <clears throat> Go back to verse 15. I am spending time with the Lord. I am investing time. I'm making time. I am beating my flesh. I am denying my flesh. My flesh tells me to stay in bed. <coughs> but I'm getting up. 
And I'm going to devote some time to the Lord. I know what my flesh wants me to do. I know what my humanity wants me to do. But because I've been spending time with the Lord, because I just sense the filling of the Holy Spirit so real in my life, I'm able to see people the way that the Lord sees people. I'm able to see my marriage the way the Lord sees my marriage. You're able to see your singleness the way the Lord sees your singleness. And then the fruit just naturally begins to flow because I've been remaining in the vine. And that's verses 4 and 5 in chapter 15. What did Jesus say? As he's talking to the disciples, he said to them, remain in me and I will remain in you. Because a branch by itself cannot bear fruit. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. Uh, you cannot bear fruit, Jesus said, unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You're the branches. If a man remains in me, he will bear much fruit. And what's the last part? Apart from me? Nah. Can't do anything. You are as close to the Lord as you want to be. You know as much of the Lord as you want to know. But when you're not connected to the vine, what, what happens? What, what happens? You've seen this. You've done this. You've pruned a tree, and you've let the branches sit there for a while. And after a few days, what do those branches look like that have been disconnected from the vine? Dried up. Crumbly. Lifeless. That's the picture that Jesus is seeking to communicate to you, to me. I've ordained you to bear fruit, but the only way that this heavenly, eternal fruit is going to be seen is because you're connected to me. And then I, as you're connected to me, I flow into your life. And I give you the strength. I give you the insight. I give you the wisdom to know how to handle life. But it only comes because you're connected to me. I've had the privilege of being in Israel a couple of times. What a blessing that is. In Israel, <clears throat> there are two major bodies of water. One is up north in the Galilee region, Sea of Galilee, Sea of Tiberias, same thing. Down south in the desert area is the Dead Sea, both water. As opposite as two bodies of water can be. Up north, the Sea of Galilee. Ah, oh, beautiful. Surrounded on the edges with beautiful greenery. And there's a, the city of Tiberias that is my favorite close by. And there's life. And there's life in the water. There's fish in the water that provide livelihood for the fishermen, and people enjoy lay, uh, the Sea of Galilee. They go swimming and snorkeling and diving, and there's vibrancy and alive there. Why? Two reasons. Number one, up north, the Sea of Galilee gets fed by underground springs, but also by the Jordan River. The Jordan River uh, comes up from the north, up from the Banyas area, about close to the Lebanese uh, border, and it comes down to the north part of the Sea of Galilee, and it feeds. The sea is getting fed from the north. But then at the south end of the Sea of Galilee, it, it flows out into a dam. And so there is water coming in, and there's water going out. And because of that, there's movement in the sea. Therefore, there's life 
that is there. So the Sea of Galilee doesn't just drink it in and keep it. No, it goes out. Now the sea, the Dead Sea, the lowest part on planet Earth, it, it has water coming in at the top, but it has no exit whatsoever. And so what happens is it becomes stagnant because there's no movement. And the water is so thick with salt, and we've been there, that you can actually go out into this water and just lay on top of it and float because it's so thick. There's no greenery there. There's no shrubs there. There's no fish there. Nobody is snorkeling. Nobody is diving. It's lifeless. Why? Because it takes it in and it just keeps it. Hmm. Is that some of us? We take from the Lord and he gives, doesn't he? He gives. We take his goodness. Oh, we're forgiven. We take that in. Oh, God is patient with me. Oh, we take that in. God is loving. God loves me. I'm chosen. Oh, we take all that in. But what Jesus is saying is, now take that and go out and bear fruit. Like the Sea of Galilee, there's something coming in, but you don't just hoard it. You share it. You share the gospel. You share forgiveness. You share acceptance. And that, that movement in your life keeps you fresh. It's, it's the way of Jesus. But so many of us, myself included, I just take it in. And I read a great verse. Oh, I love that. Thank you, Lord. Appreciate it. And it just stays there. I see his favor. He does something for me. Good doctor's report. Oh, thank you, Lord. Appreciate that. Green lights all the way. Oh, Lord, thank you so much for that. But we do we just keep that? After a while, you just kind of start getting stagnant. And you don't really see it. I, I think what we need to do, folks, we need to do, can, can, we, can we do something? Can we shift our thinking just a little bit? And can we remember, I, I want to remind you of something. Listen, if you've been sleeping, wake up. This is really, really important. You need to start reminding yourself that one day, one day, you're going to heaven. One day, you're going to say goodbye to this planet, this place that we have <laughs> invested so much of our life into. We have worked 50, 60, 70 hours because we want that thing because we're here on this earth. Can you please remind yourself that I'm going to heaven? Enjoy what you have. Enjoy everything that the Lord has given to you. Be blessed and enjoy it. But have a really light touch and be reminded that the Lord has said, I've ordained you into full-time ministry so that you can go out and bear fruit, not just fruit that's going to make you happy, but fruit that's going to last. Remind yourself that one day, Lord, one day I'm going to say goodbye to this planet. One day... All of this is going to be over, and I'm going to be in your presence. Lord, help me. Am I, do I ever prepare for that? Do I, I can't take it with me, but I can send it up ahead. Do you ever compare the two, what this world offers and what heaven offers? Moses did. Moses, raised in Egypt, had all of the best of everything. Money galore. He was in line to be the next pharaoh of Egypt. He had the best of the schooling, the best education, drove the best BMW chariots, had all of the finest clothing. He had it all. But then in the desert, when he had 
found his relationship with the Lord. In the book of Hebrews chapter 11, the author of the book of Hebrews takes you back to that time. And he says in Hebrews chapter 11, when Moses became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. Listen to this. Listen to this. Moses regarded disgrace. For the sake of Christ has of greater value than all of the treasures of Egypt because he was looking forward to his reward. Moses looked at this is what the world offers because Egypt is a type of the world. This is what I can have in the world. But wait, one day I'm going to heaven. One day I'm going to have the opportunity to walk those streets of gold. And one day I'm going to see my God face to face. But we forget that. We forget that. And I want to remind you of this. Uh, my wife and I flew not, not too long ago to California for some ministry stuff. And when we came back, they flew us from uh, LAX to Charlotte. And so we land in Charlotte. We sit there in Charlotte. Now, when we landed in Charlotte, we live in Fort Lauderdale. When we landed in Charlotte, I didn't leave the airport and try to go shopping. I didn't leave the airport and go out and try and start a business. I didn't leave the airport and go out and try to start a Bible study. You know why? Because Charlotte is just a layover. You know what we did while we were in Charlotte? We sat down, we ate our $50 hot dogs and our sodas, <laughs> and, and, and we waited. You know what we waited for? Our number to be called. Because when our number got called, we're going home. We're going home. So I didn't lay any roots down in Charlotte. I enjoyed it. It's great. Nice airport. But I'm out of here. Can I remind you of something? This planet Earth is just one big Charlotte. It's a layover. Enjoy it while you're here. Make the best of it while you're here. But this ain't your home. The Bible calls you a stranger, a sojourner that's just traveling through. So bearing fruit, fruit that lasts. Uh, I don't have time, preacher. Maybe when the kids grow up. Uh, I don't have time. I just started a business. Maybe when the business uh, gets off the ground. Uh, I don't have time right now. I just started school. I'm a sophomore in college, and I got so much homework. I got so much this, and I got maybe when I graduate, when I graduate. Take a moment when you get a chance and read the first chapter of the Old Testament book of Haggai. The, the Israelites had come back from Babylon. And they had come back energetic to rebuild the temple. And rebuild the house of God. They got busy, man. They laid the foundation. They laid a couple of blocks. And then, hmm, got distracted. It's just sitting there. Walls not even half high, have a. And the Lord sends a prophet to the people because they, they're ignoring, disregarding the Lord. And, and the Lord speaks through this prophet and he says to the people, Consider your ways. He says to the people, Have you noticed something? Have you noticed? That because you're saying you don't have time for me, but yet you're living in fine paneled houses. Have you noticed since, since you started saying we don't have time for you? Have you noticed that you plant a whole bunch of seeds, but you're harvesting very little? Have you noticed that? Have you noticed that when you put me in the back seat, have you noticed that you eat, but you never seem to have enough? 
Have you noticed that you drink water, but you're never satisfied? Have you noticed that you wear a lot of clothes, but you're never able to get warm? Have you noticed that you earn wages and you bring your wages home and you put them in purses, but these purses have holes in it? You ever feel like that? You got a raise, you got a promotion, but you don't have time for God, and you spend the money and you go, where did, where did it all go? And he goes on to say, you considered that you were going to get a lot, but you got very little. Why is that? And the Lord tells the people this, consider your ways. It's me, I blew it all away because you say you don't have time for me. Hmm. Can I remind you that he's the one that created you? And if anybody, if, if we ought to be making time for anybody, it's the one that controls our very heart, our lungs, our eyes, our kidneys. We, we should be waking up every morning and just, Lord, thank you so much. This day belongs to you, Lord. I give you a blank sheet of paper. And you write on it whatever you want to do. And listen, if the, Lord, if the Lord allows you to wake up tomorrow, guess what? You got nothing to worry about. And if you don't wake up tomorrow, guess what? You got nothing to worry about. <laughs> Producing fruit to last. Oh, I just don't know enough. I don't know enough. I'd like to serve the Lord, but I just don't know enough. In Acts chapter 4, you know what the Bible says about Peter and John? Peter and John, two of the main guys, Two of the guys that followed Jesus closer than anybody else. The Bible says that the religious looked at the re religious leaders looked at Peter and John, and they marveled because they <laughs> looked at them and said, "They're ignorant. They're unschooled. They're untrained." But we can tell that they've been with Jesus. Hmm. Give me Jesus over education anytime. I'm not against education. Don't run with that. Don't run with that. Mm -hmm. Let's start winding this down. We've got just a couple minutes left. I want to leave you this thought. Would you consider this? One day, one day you're going to stand before the Lord to give an account for our lives. One day. You, the Christian. Me, the Christian, we're going to stand before the Lord. In the book of Romans chapter 14, the Bible says you will give an account to the Lord for your life. The word account actually means to go through and give an account, like in an accounting, well, what, what was this for? And what did you do here? We will give an account. Now listen, it's not for our salvation. We're saved. We're going to heaven. Uh, our, our names are written in the book of life, but it's going to be about our faithfulness to bear fruit, godly fruit, faithfulness to the Lord. Listen to what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9 says, We make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what's due him, for the things done in the body, whether good or bad. Faithful. I'll have to answer. The Bible says in the book of James that sin, it's sin, we always think that sin is doing something wrong. It can be. But James chapter 4 says that sin is knowing what to do and not doing it. That's also sin, sin of omission. Hmm. I know, I know, I should be sharing the gospel. I know, I know, but I don't. I know I should be reading my Bible. I know I should be more loving. I know, but I'm not doing it. Okay, so James says, sin is knowing what to do and choosing to not do it. Be careful with that. Now, we'll all be, all of us as Christians, all of us as believers, again, we're almost done, all of us as believers, We'll be in heaven, but it's going to be different. Take, for example, somebody that has really kind of not taken the Lord serious, 
they've kind of just skated along with the things of God, um, and they made it. They're in heaven. Compare that to a little shot glass. You fill that little shot glass to the top, and it is filled to capacity. Now take a, a glass that is bigger, and you fill that. Now that has more capacity. Take a 55-gallon drum and fill that to the top. That has greater capacity. The shot glass, that's a Christian that really didn't take their walk with the Lord serious. They're in heaven, but the capacity to enjoy the fullness of all that God has was given up because here on this earth, I, I didn't really have the time for it. I mean, I prayed the prayer. I gave my life to Jesus, but eh, didn't really. You'll be in heaven, but your capacity to enjoy it will be, and you'll be happy. You'll be filled to the brim. You'll be completely full. Others, they, they, gave, they, they gave more of their life, and they're filled to that capacity. And then there's those of you that you're just all in, man. You just serve the Lord. All three of these Christians will be filled to capacity, but the ability to enjoy will be different. Mm. I want to be that. Let me leave you with four things that you are. You are, number one, you are called to intimacy with the Lord. You're called to that. If you have time or you don't have time, but you need to know that you are called to have intimacy with him. Number two, you are called and ordained into full-time ministry. Number three, you are called to be a fruit-bearing child of God. And number four, you are called to not procrastinate. There's some things you can put off in there. Eh, I'll do the dishes tomorrow. Mm, I'll do the wash next week. Oof, smells. I'll wash the car. I'll clean out the car later, next week. Uh, got burritos laying under the seat. <laughs> There's things you can put off. Getting serious with the Lord is not one of them. The story is told. I'm going to pray here in just a minute. But the story is told. A man who was going through the drawers of his, uh, of his uh, desk Pulls out, pulls out a drawer of his desk, and he sees a receipt. And he's looking at this receipt, and it's for a pair of shoes that he dropped off at the shoe repair shop five years ago. I never picked up those shoes. Five years ago. <laughs> he ain't got them. He don't have them. I mean, it's five years. Who would keep a pair of shoes for five years? But I just got to find out. I got to find out. He goes to the shoe repair shop. He walks in. Can I help you? Um, I feel really dumb. I feel really stupid, but I dropped off a pair of shoes here five years ago. And I know you don't have them, but I just, I don't know. I just thought I'd come by. And the guy behind the counter goes, I don't know. Let me go check. So he comes back. He doesn't have them. And the guy goes, I knew you have, didn't have them. I knew Five years, I knew you didn't have them. And the guy goes, oh, no, I got them. They'll be ready next Thursday. <laughs> Put it off. One day, it's been said that the Christian's favorite day is some day. Don't let it be that. Because James chapter 4 says, our life is like a vapor. It's here one minute and gone the next. Amen? Amen. Lord, we pray that you would help us, help us to treat you with respect, Lord. Help us to treat you with the honor that you deserve. Our God, may we find ourselves that we don't let anything get in our way that would hinder us. We're told in your word to throw off the things that hinder us, that we may run with perseverance this race that's marked out for each one of us. Lord, we don't want to lag behind. We don't want to just be sitting on the bench. Lord, you've done so much for us. You've given us your son. 
he who did not spare his own son, will he not freely give you all things? And so, Lord, we thank you for your son, and we pray now that we would live a life that is worthy of what your son did for us. And we pray in Jesus' name.